So my name is Will Robinson, and today I'm going to talk about Web3 games. For me, that means games that use NFTs, blockchains, decentralized ledgers, smart contracts, cryptocurrencies, etc. I've designed this talk for people who have heard about these things, but haven't been behind the curtains, so to speak, who haven't seen what the industry is like and would maybe want to know why people are motivated by it and where things are going. Uh, it turns out that most people in this space are interested in um, lying about it, so I'm hoping I can give you some truths, at least. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to make it clear that despite me working in crypto for four years, uh, I have empirical data to say that at least 97% of Web3 projects are misguided, malicious, or broken. And the ratio is even worse for games in Web3. So uh, just want to make sure that I'm not here to red pill you. Uh, in fact, hopefully I'll convince you not to make a Web3 game because it's either too early, too dangerous, too expensive, too criminal, or too evil to bother. Uh, instead, I'm going to give you some mental models to think critically about what's going on uh, and let you know what I think people in the industry would rather keep secret. At the same time, I want to highlight towards the end of my talk how there are some interesting potentials that Web3 has offered, at least one game community, uh, which has done some beautiful things uh, that's fully open source, it has no token, it has no venture capital, has no carbon footprint, uh, and it values the labors of its community uh, in really interesting ways. Um, and it uses blockchains to actually like, dig deep into the affordances of the medium, uh, and so I'll be happy to talk about that later. Uh, me? So in 2017, I completed my doctoral thesis in game studies. I focused on how rules incentivize people to enact stories. Uh, I worked on feminist, Marxist, post-colonial critiques of games, in-game items, and mods and modders. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Danger Will Robin. If you want to check out the website and the project I'm working on now, it's called Alliance.xyz. Uh, before even graduating, uh, actually, uh, my dissertation, I'd already decided to leave academia. I was building a career as a forensic crypto auditor, uh, which is a pretty strange thing. I was actually doing it in an accounting firm. Uh, and you might think this is a radical shift, but for me, I was still chasing the same rush that game designers chase, which is that I'm addicted to twist endings. Uh, I know this is cringe, but ever since watching Richard Kelly's Donnie Darko at age 16, I've been obsessed with twist endings, and I've been setting myself up for surprise by the media I consume ever since. Almost anyone who's ever designed a game knows that they are especially suited at bewildering even their makers. So games are almost like players in themselves. They lead players down garden paths, they have players evolve dominant strategies that are new and unexpected and unforeseen, and we usually call these second or third order effects. These higher order effects are table stakes for people who think about systems and for systems designers, trying to get your initial conditions, your incentives just right so that your system reaches some interesting experience. Well, that's a maddening ordeal. Um, and so Bitcoin is totally along that track. Uh, and I know you've heard of it, uh, but maybe you have, don't have a good mental model, so here's one that I like to have. Um, it's a spreadsheet. That's all it is. It's a spreadsheet. You can reduce the number in your cell to increase the number in someone else's cell. You're not allowed to reduce anybody else's numbers, and nobody can increase numbers unless they decrease their own. Um, that's the game. It's like soccer. If everybody plays by these rules, uh, something fun emerges. Uh, and what was interesting is that these numbers were, of course, meaningless at the beginning, like points in soccer, right? But because the sheet runs, regardless of what you do to it, can't be stopped, can't be stopped by governments or by corporations. Um, it has an intrinsic value to have a number on this sheet. And so you'll pay to have someone reduce their number to increase yours. Uh, and it turns out uh, that Satoshi Nakamoto's intellectual contribution was that this is only possible if you waste energy. And if everybody agrees to take the ledger that provably wastes the most energy, well, then you get a censorship-resistant currency. We'll talk about why you might want that later. Um, but the problem being solved here in a cryptographic framework is called Byzantine Fault Tolerance. If you want to Google it later, the Wikipedia articles are very interesting. But if, if you do waste this thing, and if you know, at least less than 50%, like if any owner owns less than 50% of the wasted energy, then you have a credible, neutral system on which you can rely that it will behave the way the code says it will. Um, and you'll want to remember that for later, because that will be helpful for thinking about games. Um, and so. 
because it was making this funny money, uh, it was a pyramid scheme. It was just people, computer playing in their basements, coders, pariahs, people who were made fools of for thinking Bitcoin was real. It was faking it until it made it, basically. Um, and, and I think of Bitcoin as like an entity, like another player, like a game that plays itself. It has its own personality, its own agency, um, and not just a player, but I think of it as, as a devil. Like you, you can sell your soul to it and it will empower you with wealth and riches like Dr. Faust. Um, and I actually think of it more than a devil, I think of it as a Lovecraftian elder god. Something that like cultists in the 1920s in New England are like throwing shit in the reagents into, a, into like a cauldron to summon something terrible uh, that, you know, might give them power, might enslave them, who knows. Um, and the reason is because it creates value, Bitcoin, for people, captures that value and redistributes it. It pays its followers, right? And those followers then proselytize. They go on and they say more and more and more Bitcoin everywhere. And it works. It's a self-perpetuating philosophical object. Um, and you'll want to remember that too. If a bunch of people hold the same asset, they will coordinate to increase its value. That'll be helpful for Web3 games later. Uh, here you can see that um, Bitcoin did exactly what it was supposed to do. A censorship resistant money allowed foreign powers to fund an internal terrorist organization or revolution in Canada, depending on your side of the argument. Um, and we won't debate that here, but essentially this is like the native beautiful possibility uh, that the Bitcoiners see, right? So at the moment when 2008 happens, the crash occurs uh, and the governments, instead of punishing the banks, prints more money to bail them out. Basically taxes everybody who's holding dollars by saying your dollars are now worth less so I can give some money to the banks to make the banking system not collapse instead of you know, doing something else. Satoshi Nakamoto gets very angry. He says, this isn't a very good thing to do. I'm gonna create Bitcoin. Uh, but more than that, like imagine if things got really bad. Your government became despotic, all powerful, could check your credit cards, could freeze them. As soon as you want to resist that government, which has now massive surveillance because it's the future and surveillance is easy and free, well, how are you gonna resist this super government? And so for the cypherpunks who are building Bitcoin, they're trying to come up with a money outside of normal you know, regulations. And so we make Bitcoin to resist government, to be illegal, to be a criminal object, like by design, it is, it is meant to be criminal. Um, and, and criminal is, is not always a bad thing, right? Like in a terrible government, criminal is like actually the good guys. Uh, and so that's how they see it. And so Bitcoin becomes this like reliable code that anybody can depend on just like TCP IP, like the internet protocol, right? It's a standard, we can follow it. And, and this is one more thing to remember for Web3 games, you're building something that's reliable, right? A, a, a layer protocol that everybody can build on and expect to behave the way it was set out to. No one will have the power to change it. Okay, just as a side note, these cypherpunks, although they had these like noble ambitions to like, you know, stop despotic governments, they do come from a pretty creepy place uh, of like anti-Semitic uh, gold bug world. And if you wanna read more about it, I recommend David Columbia's book. Um, but the same with the Lovecraftian cultists, just because they had intentions and ideologies and politics doesn't mean that the thing they eventually summoned had those same politics and ideas, right? The games you design don't do what you want the games that you design to do, they have a life of their own. Um, okay, at the same time that <laughs> the banks are unfairly supported by government central powers, Vitalik Buterin uh, is upset because World of Warcraft has nerfed his warlock. Uh, the warlock had <laughs> a drain life spell uh, and a siphon life it was called and it was removed um, and his entire build was ruined. And I think he jokingly said, though it's not clear if it's a joke with Vitalik, that Blizzard had way too much control over his game. Uh, and then set on a long course journey, just like Satoshi did to you know, neuter government, to neuter game developers, to make them subservient to their games, so to speak. So uh, it takes years. Uh, he eventually uh, comes up with a new cryptocurrency called Ethereum, and instead of being just a ledger with plus and minus numbers, um, it's a global computer. Uh, every cell can be a program now, uh, and a bad computer, like a really bad computer. Like imagine the whole world sharing one Palm Pilot, bad computer. Um, that's, what we're, that's what we're after, because it's hard to get the whole world to agree to one computer state. 
if, if anybody tells you they can, you can get the whole world to agree on a very large state, you can probably say they're lying. Like they're, they're part of the camp of liars or they misunderstand their own technology. You can't get a decentralized view of a large state right now with our technology. Uh, okay, so he, you know, in this sense, you know, you could imagine putting the rules of World of Warcraft on the computer, not run World of Warcraft on this computer, and then sign off on them as like, these are the rules, nobody changed them. Now, any game designer will tell you that's untenable. We need to evolve and adapt our game. Heck, even chess has patch notes every 400 years, right? So, you know, to think that it would make sense to keep a game stable wouldn't be ideal, but instead think, how would we get a community to govern those rules, to, to decentralize that ownership of the game? And that's where Ethereum is gonna sort of try and propose this, this, this benefit. So all these cells, like we said before, computer programs can be anywhere. The owner can be the program, it can own its own programs. Uh, the programs can own money. This is a, a, a novel like shift for most people. Programs owning money is weird, right? Imagine a self-driving car that charges you and then it takes its money and it goes and it pays for gas from a self, you know, gas filling terminal and then just is a virus, right? The car makes enough money, it makes an order itself to a factory to make a new car and that car shows up on a boat and it starts making its own money. You know, you could conceivably think of protocols living on their own in this way, right? Um, and so the first major use case for this supercomputer machine was just to create mini bitcoins, right? Every cell became its own ledger, a program for another split up of tokens. Uh, and that enabled this ICO, the initial coin offering boom of 2017, where we could once again um, do criminal activity with crypto. In this case, the criminal activity though, wasn't subverting governments in revolution, it was uh, subverting the SEC. So the Securities and Exchange Commission, right, has clear rules on like, how you can like tokenize your company. Usually it is through stocks and through regulations. I was an auditor, I can tell you the, the, the list of regulations is very long. It's very expensive to make a stock and to get people to buy your stocks. But what Ethereum did was permissionlessly let you buy stocks. You could just say, these are my stocks and you can buy them here and if my company goes up in value, these tokens will go up in value, which is very dangerous. A lot of people got sued by the SEC. I don't recommend anybody do it. Um, and the thing is, people aren't used to having that kind of financial access. We weren't growing up in like schools that trained us to buy stocks directly from the source companies, right? We have brokers who make sure that we're not drunk when we buy our stocks very often. Or, you know, even Robinhood gets in trouble when it puts fireworks after you buy your stocks. But here, like we can gamify the heck out of stocks. We can do whatever we want with stocks, no one can stop us. Uh, except when eventually you find out who you really are as a real person and then you go to jail. So people lost their shirts and more, contracts broke, contracts were like lying, et cetera, et cetera, but a tiny percentage of the ICO boom produced what we call today decentralized finance. We invented how to swap tokens, how to get loans and leverage, and basically rebuild the financial sector. Um, in crypto, here are the top five as of uh, yesterday, uh, and you can see like Maker did the first thing we needed to do, which was a stable coin, put USD on uh, the chain. Aave lending that lets you basically uh, borrow against that USD so you can leverage up uh, or short positions. These are just sort of fundamental pieces, building blocks of any financial system. Those were built. Um, and you know, by 2019, we have this great financial system, the fees are way lower. Like if you're trading on Coinbase, it's a 10 times more expensive to make a same trade, uh, but we can only have seven trades per second for the whole world to share. That's the Palm Pilot again, seven trades. Visa does 40,000 transactions a second, right? Oh, it might be 15 trades, but it's really bad. Um, and so uh, the, that, that was the good news, no more brokers, no more middlemen. The bad news is we could now have like drunk 12 year olds, with an internet connection, taking leveraged long positions on pictures of cats, right? That's the financial system that ended up being built, a crazy casino, right? And the knee-jerk reaction here is like, well, we gotta regulate this, but it, it's unregulatable. That was the point. We created this elder god that gets to enslave us now. It cannot be censored. Um, the, the, the sort of cognate, I would say, is it's kind of like discovering peer-to-peer -peer sex. 
Um, right, so we had brokers, these priests, you know, you'd go to them, they'd let you have sex with, you know, one other person, only if that person was like a different gender than you, et cetera, et cetera, and then we found out we can peer-to-peer -peer sex, and we did a lot of it, and it was messy, we had lots of sexually transmitted diseases, we had unwanted sex, we had, you know, sexual assault, uh, we had unwanted pregnancies, et cetera, because we didn't teach anybody about how to have peer-to-peer -peer sex. And we haven't taught anybody how to do peer-to-peer -peer finance, and so people are getting all kinds of scams, money's lost, et cetera, et cetera, not knowing what they're buying. Um, and so that's the situation we're in. Probably can't stop peer-to-peer -peer sex. You probably can't really stop this either. You'll only get to maybe educate people out of this problem. Um, okay. Um, then, at the same time, we're creating NFTs. So this is where we get to the sort of game side. Um, the model is different. Um, this is like one cell in that Ethereum sheet from before. So a single one of these cells here, one of these programs, looks like this, and an NFT is very simple. It's an array of numbers. So, and it's not even an array of numbers, it's just an array of slots. So one, two, three, four, and the person who owns that slot. Alice owns slot one, maybe Bob owns slot two, uh, and then they can trade. You, all you're allowed to do is say, I own this slot, and I no longer own this slot, I give it to someone else. That's the rules. In that smart contract, you usually have one website link, it points to a, a service that'll hold an, a, a JPEG. And if you own slot three, that means you own JPEG three. Uh, if you own slot five, you own JPEG five. That's an NFT, that's all there is to it. Uh, there's a way to hash that file that's on the other server so you know that it doesn't change. Um, and then all of a sudden you have the capacity to um, move objects. We tried to, in 2017, as a crypto community, to make a game on chain, and uh, we ran into that seven transactions per second problem. You can't <laughs> crash Ethereum, basically, with this thing called CryptoKitties, uh, which was just a way to like breed cats on chain that looked like they wore sailor suits or different fun, cute things. Um, but these objects um, inherited like these, this art status. Um, some of the early ones today maintain Veblen status, like a way of showing your wealth. Um, they also avoid a lot of SEC regulation because their artworks for personal use a lot of the time, and I'm not your lawyer and I'm not your financial advisor and everything I say you can't take me to court about, but basically um, a lot of very wealthy people moved their capital out of DeFi when regulations started getting hairy and into NFTs. It was a place to do more regulatory arbitrage. This time it was less criminal, but only because no one had ever thought to regulate this kind of thing. Um, and so NFTs became the stand-in, this new shelling point, a place to store value. Um, and the OG ones, like the CryptoPunks here, they're worth hundreds of thousands of dollars each. Um, and you think, well, why? It's just a JPEG. But it's more than a JPEG, it's a coordination tool. In the same way that Bitcoin is just a number on a spreadsheet, this is the first NFT. So it is the obvious place to store value and acts as a social coordinating mechanism. People can then, look, if you're starting a new venture capital firm uh, or you're an old venture capital firm and you wanna like raise money and then invest in crypto projects, there's no way they'll take you seriously. But if you buy one of these things and make it your profile picture, all of a sudden you show your commitment to this industry and to this idea you're ready to put your money where your mouth is. And so they act as a kind of social signal. Social signaling is so valuable. And they're $100,000, but they're resellable. So it's not like you lost $100,000, you just lost the time value of that $100,000 and then took on exposure to the price change. Okay, so NFTs come out, they're very exciting. People are very uh, interested in growing them. We have this model of many people owning one collection. And we talk back about Bitcoin when people like own a lot of one asset, they can coordinate to grow its value. They all become shillers, shilling each other's bags, coordinating around them. Today, or only a couple of days ago, I believe there was like a $450 million deal for an NFT collection company to basically come into existence and compete with brands like Hermes because the community owns the brand in a decentralized way, in, in a way that's totally new and novel. Um, and evades regulation in interesting ways. Okay, so now we've got NFTs, they're exciting, Axie Infinity. The NFTs start to become useful. They're being played with in games. And again, the game is not on the blockchain. What happens is I connect my wallet to an account, 
and that account looks at the blockchain and sees that I own something, I, and by own something it sees my address, crypto address at slot three, it looks up what slot three is, it's that, not CryptoKitty, but Axie, it's an axolotl on the left, and it populates it for me in game. It's a database lookup. No logic is put on game. I win some games, a centralized company called Sky Mavis then goes and prints some tokens to my account, right? And it does that printing on chain. That's the model of the Web3 game that's super successful. Axie Infinity here had a valuation recently at like $60 billion. It's, a, it's like a mobile game, right? It looks nothing like any $60 billion game you've ever seen. It doesn't play as well. Um, its community is um, very different from most. It's almost entirely based in the Philippines and the global south uh, because when you play this game, you get those tokens and those tokens have values and those, that value can be higher than what you can do you know, working in one context or another. Um, and people here misunderstand why this game is valuable. They think uh, it's valuable because it's somehow revolutionized play to earn. You can now play games and earn money and we've solved capitalism. Absolutely not. People who believe that fell prey to a very terrible pyramid scheme and the value of axes, the value of this company, have all plummeted since the curves of growth have not mapped on to the, the flood of uh, inflation in this game. But what this game did do is millions of players with no banks all of a sudden using Axie as the front end to DeFi, using Axie as the front end to the blockchain. Um, Axie isn't on Ethereum. It's on its own chain called Ronin. And the people who own Ronin are the people who made Axie. And Ronin has its own currency exchange called Katana. And the people who made Katana are the people who made Axie. And when Katana takes a fee, Axie's taking a fee. And so what you have here is a $40 billion game project, but it's a loss leader to a neobank. It's a new way of banking people who've never had access to banks. The promise of Bitcoin was to bank the unbanked. It turns out we're going to do it through... Uh, you know, cute axolotls on a mobile phone app. You can't even buy, get this app on the App Store. You have to like download the APK. It's like there's a lot of friction. But uh, the, the sense here is that games right now in Web3 are acting as loss leaders. They, games on Web3 are strictly less fun and they are strictly more expensive to make and they have more friction for their players. There should be no reason a Web3 game sending on its own merits would be better than a Web2 game. What they offer is a new way to monetize players through banking. And the problem is there's a lot of regulatory um, uncertainty here. So doing it is very dangerous. You have to be comfortable with a lot of risk. But if it works, you can disrupt much more than any game industry. Um, okay, so mental model check here. These aren't really games. Right, their front ends, their marketing, their user acquisition, right, for players to then have wallets who have access to all of Web3 and all the fancy, you know, um, regulatory bank business. Now, <sighs> Web2 companies like Ubisoft have tried to capitalize on this NFT movement. There's a lot of excitement around owning the objects you have. But, I mean, I technically own the objects I have in my Steam marketplace. I, I bought a Dazzle skin recently. I main Dazzle on Dota 2. Um, and that Dazzle skin, uh, it's available via API. It, it's an open API. I, anybody can read that I have it. You can display it anywhere you want. Uh, it, it's basically as good as being on a blockchain. And I can sell it on the store. And the fee for selling it is two pennies. Um, the fee for selling, <laughs> there's no crypto fee lower than two pennies. Um, so, the, the benefits, people will say, is true ownership, but like, I don't know what that really means. And other than saying, tomorrow Steam could turn around and turn off its services. It could kill the Steam store. And if your blockchain items were in a smart contract, theoretically, that could be possible that it wouldn't be turn offable. And theoretically, there is value capture there. So I would say that this is like, really a stepping stone. It's a way to also get players to start connecting their wallets to um, companies so they can have your ID and your on-chain identity and your on-chain like financialization. There's a benefit there for sure long-term. 
On the ESG side, because I know we talked about how you have to waste energy for Bitcoin, I just want to be clear. Um, this was on Tezos. That's a different blockchain. It doesn't use proof of work. It uses a totally different consensus model. This did not cause any carbon footprint. It was really annoying to see that that being the major critique against Ubisoft. Um, also, uh, the majority of blockchains today don't have proof of work. Um, it's too expensive for them to get proof of work. Instead, they use things like proof of stake. Instead of wasting energy, because you have to waste something for your blockchain to work. Uh, instead of wasting energy, they waste the time value of money. You lock up your money, its time value is now in jeopardy. That's what we're wasting, uh, not, not energy anymore. Uh, and Ethereum, which is proof of work, will be merging to a non-proof of work system very, very, very soon. So I think the worrying about ESG when there's all this other terrible shit going on in Web3 would not, would not worry about that. And ESG is a in, in, in about the environment side, just to be clear. Uh, so yeah, Celo, Algorand, Cosmos, Polkadot, Solana. Don't worry about ESG, worry about other things. Um, okay, so I promised I'd get to like why Web3 games are um, cool, what I like about them, uh, and where there's some possibility uh, for salvation. Um, this is a screenshot from my favorite Web3 game. Uh, in fact, I started an entire decentralized autonomous organization to play it. Uh, it's called Dark Forest, uh, and it's an open source game. Uh, and what I think is possible uh, is that you can make open source a profitable endeavor for all the people who want to contribute to the same code base, no matter who they are or where they are, um, by paying them using Web3. And by making that copy of open source valuable. So in the same way that Web3 made NFTs, JPEGs, not copy-pastable, created scarcity in a visual object, you can create scarcity in a piece of code. And that can let that piece of code uh, get owned by the people who contributed and built it. Uh, without having any need for venture funding or studios, just hobbyists building together. Um, and that's what's happening in Dark Forest. Uh, and you likely haven't heard of it because it is just hobbyists building it together, right? They don't have a marketing budget. The only people who hear about it are, you know, crypto nerds who get nerd sniped by this thing and who hear about other nerds they respect getting nerd sniped by this thing. Um, so unlike games like, and this is what I was studying in, in university, um, Skyrim, or Little Big Planet, which depend on suckering players into building levels so that the value of the game can grow, and then capturing that value, and not redistributing it to the players, but to investors and the core dev team. Um, so it's, it's not like that, right? It's not an exploitation of labor. Here we can have a game protocol that depends on the players building it, but where the proceeds can go back to those players. That's, that's an interesting switch, right? Because we all love user-generated content. We just wish the generators of that content could get fairly compensated for it. And it does happen. Like, again, Dota, I'm a big fan. The pros who play at the International, like I pay $15 for a battle pass. I get to watch them play professionally. They get some amount of that $15. The developers get some amount of that $15. They're laborers, those, those pros. And they labor for Dota. They make the game more valuable by playing it. And in the same way, Dark, Dark Force takes on that kind of role. Um, to give you a sense, just before we, we go on a little bit more of what, what Dark Force is, it's basically Galcon, if you've ever played that. Like, take over a planet, planet makes energy, send that energy to another planet, now you got two planets making energy. Send those two planets to one bigger one, capture three planets, exponential growth of just like moving um, across the map. Um, what's cool about Dark Force, though, uh, is it's played in zero knowledge. What that means is every move you make in this giant world uh, is provably true in how you craft it and present it to the blockchain, but no one knows what you did. It's like playing chess in the dark. Only once you shine your light on the spot where that move happened can you see what happened there for real. That's an interesting feature, right? Because there's no central server to handle fog of war, right? It's a decentralized on-chain game. No one owns the protocol, so there's no like database where I can look up, hey, what's under this fog of war? You have to create Fog of War in totally new ways, uh, which is very interesting to see cryptographic primitives do that. Um, and what that means is because there's no central database, there's no core team with superior powers over the game compared to say, um, like any other competitive video game where devs can have like a backend access and knowledge, um, winning in this game is fair, 
it's, it's provably fair, uh, right? You just followed the protocol's rules. And so what the, what the game community does is it awards prizes to the winners. And those prizes are just like NFTs, just like commemorative badges. And they're commemorative NFTs on no chain. So uh, again, no environmental impact on this chain. Um, and it gets us to the top 63. We've never seen a level five, six, or seven planet, which are the biggest ones, get sold. Um, but uh, you know, they sell for about fifteen to forty thousand dollars. The smaller ones, I think, a big one would sell for a million um, today, because uh, they're really hard to win at this game, right? This is like an enormous amount of engineering power to come first. Uh, you need to have like a good team working round the clock for weeks, and it's sort of like a nerd competition, like a similar to like a math Olympiad, winning this game. Uh, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, provable credentials for the team that wins. They are able to solve a bunch of cryptographic problems and, and think deeply about it. Um, at the same time, it's like still very playable for any novice who wants to just like struggle through like a bit of crypto learning. Um, okay, so in addition to these players um, winning planets for um, winning the game, they'll also get rewarded planets for revealing their strategies for how they won. Because often players do crazy things. The winner in round one rewrote the client of the game. So the, the whole front end, like they took the open source code and then found the places where there were awaits in move making and instead of serializing the moves, just parallelized them and was able to just make more moves faster um, in changing the code. Um, in round uh, two, so the, the team that won, we don't know what they did. But the, in round one, for having revealed the new client, um, they want an additional planet. And that's really cool because now you're paying your players to share their improvements on the game with everyone else as a community. Uh, so in round three, we made like a marketplace so that in-game you could trade your like strategic weapons. Uh, there was no marketplace in the game before. The community made the marketplace, the people who made the community, they got a commemorative NFT. The NFTs have no value, right? They're, they're freely given, but the community ascribes them value through their cachet. Like if you have one of these planets, it's because you were pretty cool and did something pretty cool at some point. Um, and I would like to buy it from you, not only because I think it's a valuable planet, but I know I'm funding someone who's building in Web3 at the cutting edge, right? I feel good about what I'm buying because the people making this game are, are, are like only working on donations. Right, they're, they, like A16Z will come up to them at dinner with like a $10 million check at, at any valuation they want. And they're just like, no, like this, is, this belongs to the community. And that's a very different approach, right, in thinking about this. Um, okay, so where does this take us, right? What is the, what is the point uh, of Web3 games from this angle? Because it's hard to make money with it. Um, it's hard to build a new community. There's no way you can scale this, right? Like this, this, these players, ooh, these players here, like you can only handle about a thousand players at a time, maybe two thousand at best. Uh, and then you'd have to like work on new blockchains. And like when we, when this game does play, the entire blockchain shuts down. Like there's no way to use it. Uh, you have to pay huge fees to get past the game in order to like get your transactions through. Um, and that's one of the fundamental problems with Web3 games. So it won't be a retail sensation, right? It'll be a niche community of super engineers who maybe are building up their CVs in the way that like people build their CVs with GitHub repos. Um, so not, not thoroughly exciting in that way. Um, if they're gonna be valuable, these kinds of games, uh, they're gonna do different things than what normal games do. They're gonna stress test new blockchains. They're going to be training grounds for new engineers. Uh, they're going to be credentials for CVs. Uh, they're not going to be these new fun times that reach 40 million players. It's just like not possible to put on-chain games to 40 million players, um, which is sad. It's like a sad truth, like really a big bummer. I sad about it every day, actually. Um, instead, we're gonna see a lot more of this, right? A lot more games that rely on some centralized organization um, running a normal web two game and then pushing some data to the chain to get some financialization of players. Uh, that's, the, that's the fundamental premise here. Um, this is just way more popular, we're gonna get way more of it. And these games 
are serving as user acquisition to their underlying blockchains. So what's good for Axie is they own the blockchain they're acquiring users to. But when I go downstairs and look at all the booths of all the people who are making games on someone else's blockchain, I get really worried. Because I, I, I'm, I'm I don't know how you're going to capture the value. Maybe through a wallet that will like, start taking fees at the wallet level. Uh, but certainly the people who are going to capture the value are the blockchains that are under that level. right? And so if you are making one of these games, make sure you talk to that blockchain and you ask for a lot of money, because you're doing them a huge service. And well, that's something that, that I do for the companies I help. right? So this is me again. <laughs> What I do in real life is I run an accelerator for Web3 games. Uh, I help game companies stop making games on Web3 or help Web2 companies start making games in Web3, depending on the use cases and what they need. Um, so the, you know, the, it's so hard to, to get it through in, in one chat. But basically, we have guilds who are managing thousands of players now because those players are playing to earn in these sort of pyramid schemes and they're able to take wealth out. Those guilds help connect them to players, and uh, sorry, and to, to game makers. Uh, I maintain a large collection of those. Um, also the studios that are in charge of game making or the entities that are in charge of game making at the, all the layer ones. So like Solana, Celo, Algorand, whatever, the whole list, Terra, um, maintain relationships with those, trying to get people who are in this space to safely um, and not um, scamily, hopefully, as best as we can, um, try and make things like this. Uh, that's, that's the sort of state of the industry uh, for now. Um, look, I, I want to leave a lot of room for questions. Uh, the sort of possibility space of where this talk can go will be very long, and I'll give really long-winded qu answers to your questions, hopefully. So uh, if you do have any, um, um, please feel free to, uh, to ask. Uh, yeah, that was, that's my talk. Thanks. Test, test. All right. Hey, uh, thanks. This was a really insightful talk. It helped me a lot. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to wrap my head around is whether blockchain offers something that databases don't, like a standard database doesn't offer, to, um, to a company like Microsoft or a major game publisher. Um, why would they choose, for example, to try to, I don't know, put... Um, the Arbiter's Sword in the hands of a Call of Duty player using blockchain as opposed to a database of some sort. Um, and um, it doesn't that, seem to me like it makes any sense. Like, it, why it, would you do that? But anyway, that's th my question. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and the reason it doesn't make sense is because it doesn't make sense for the most part. Um, so there have been a lot of attempts to make centralized blockchains uh, over the last seven or eight years. Um, enterprise blockchains, we call them. It's sort of ridiculous because the point of a blockchain, right, was to make a uncensorable, right, like government fighting machine. Um, and as soon as you centralize it, then the government can just lean on the company that's centralizedly owning it and say, stop, and it's over. So as soon as you centralize a blockchain, there's every benefit that it could have had from, you know, um, allowing people to you know, guarantee certain things about their NFTs not moving or changing, gone, out the window. So there's, there's literally zero reason for a centralized blockchain, like none. Um, if Microsoft can somehow get a decentralized consortium of people that's so decentralized that a government couldn't stop it, then you enable um, regulation circumvention. You get, enable things like what we call regulatory arbitrage finding opportunities against Web2 companies because they have to follow the rules that Web3 companies don't. But the thing is, Microsoft's a publicly traded company. So if it starts to break any kind of rules, it's going to be in deep trouble. And it has a lot of money to pay fines. And so it's a good target to go after. Um, so I, I would be very nervous about seeing as something like that. I, I do think that the disruptors in this industry will not be like classic Web2 companies. They'll be companies that can take a lot more regulatory risk at least for the near foreseeable future. And then, so, so then a normal database is great. Take that sword from this dragon game and put it in this gun game. Like, uh, that's cool. Um, and make your database publicly available and open API and let people come in and use it and 
have other people use that item uh, and, and build a marketplace in Web2. Like you can build all these normal things. So the only other real reason is that it might be cheaper. Like there's so much free work being done in Web3, so much open source code available. You can just use that infrastructure, even though it's like fundamentally worse and wasn't made for this purpose as a sort of leapfrog cheat and not have to build anything yourself. I can see some, sometimes like a really operational reason like that be there. Hey. Yes, I'm honestly still kind of confused on the value of um, like some of the, these, these NFTs. Just taking the example up here. Oh yeah, Praxis. here. Um, so you own these characters on, on that particular blockchain, which sounds like the blockchain itself is owned by a company. Um, yeah. Even if the blockchain survives, if the game were to shut down, right, what, where, where does the value come from, right? The fact that you own these characters, but the game itself is, itself is gone. Sure, sure, sure. So my argument is that the company has value, um, not these assets. These assets actually have gone down in value dramatically. I, I bought these with company dollars, sorry company, for um, $2,000, I think. Uh, I think they're worth like $300 today. Um, these objects are loss leaders to getting more players onto a platform that can do all of uh, this. If you get players to use your app as the front end to finance, especially when those players come from a world where they don't have access to banking, lending, trading, swapping, leveraging, shorting, you get to be the owner of all the fees they're going to pay. The lifetime value of your players is huge, and so the company that made this game owns those players, owns the front end those players have to this unregulated financial sector, and those players don't live in the USA where there's an enormous amount of regulation. They live in places where you can actually get around a lot of these problems. Um, and so that's why there's a lot of value being, that can be captured, right? When people valued these at $2,000, the reason was really weird. So you'll have to bear with me as I do with my hands. So imagine a world where there's three axes only, because that's what you need to field a team. Okay, but we'll call those three axes one axis for the sake of my model. There's one axis, um, and this axis makes SLP, smooth love potions. That's the currency in the game. If it plays the single player campaign, it gets some smooth love potions. Um, if you want to make another axis, you'll need a certain amount of smooth love potions and breed your axis. If I want my friend to play, uh, I need to give them smooth love potions or breed them an axis. They're scarce. There are a limited number. The protocol sort of limits the number. Um, so that smooth love potion, right, um, scarcity, leads to an increase in value of smooth love potion. Now my friend doesn't want to play that badly. You know, maybe he'll buy it for $2, right? But someone hears, wait a second, you played this game for a day and made two bucks, right, playing? That's crazy, I want an Axie too. But now, okay, two or three people want to do this, the price has gone up because demand has gone up and the supply of Axie is still really constrained. So now there's you know, $3 for an Axie. Some new people here, $3 a day, that's 50% better. 10 people want to play now. Because there's 10, demand spikes, value of an Axie spikes on the market. And what happens is this crazy um, funnel problem happens where these things spike to, to hundreds of, or thousands of dollars as there was not enough supply to meet demand. And because they were so expensive, demand grew because people thought you could make more money with them. But like a pyramid scheme, eventually you reach a point where the number of axes is growing exponentially, because each one you make can make more, and the number of players coming in isn't growing as exponentially. There's a sort of stop where we have huge amounts of inflation of axes, and then the price just goes as close to zero as it can over time. So they don't have value, right? They have a limited value through people who miscalculate where they are in the pyramid, right? That's, and that's very dangerous, right? And you wanna protect players and kids from, from like huge mistakes in their financial decision making. Um, so yeah, no value there, value in owning the front end. In the same way that Facebook is like the internet for many people, right? Where the Facebook app is their like interface to the internet. Facebook owns those people, owns their marketplace, or the way WeChat in China owns all the marketplaces of the people using it, Axie will be a super app. It'll be your social media network, it'll be your bank, et cetera. And so this is a loss leader Ponzi scheme that attracts lots of players. I think that's, that's the way to have the mental model. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. 
Hey, over here. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to like clarify what you said earlier. So um, you're saying that the value of the these NFTs or these tokens in general are basically, they don't exist. And the only value is to the company who initially started and fronted the whole thing because they got the profit immediately. And then it eventually all of these oh, no. lose. Yeah, sorry, I'll clarify that. So the company actually made no money off these NFTs almost. The, these NFTs, when you make the SLP and create the Axie and sell it, you get 95% of the profits for what you sold it for. And the players were the ones creating them. That's what created the economic flywheel and the incentive to play in the first place. They just took a 5% cut of the sale. Sure. Okay. So then uh, my follow-up would be like, so then what is, uh, I guess, the overall purpose of adding these in the first place if it's just like artificially essentially generating, generating like a small amount of income before it disseminates again and there was no point in it in the first place? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat it again? So, so uh, the way it sounded like was, um, and maybe I misunderstood, was uh, the value you're getting from these uh, tokens that you made are like very small and then uh, it's only given to like, you know, set amount of players at the beginning or something. And then slowly over time, you know, even these don't have value anymore. So then what was the purpose of like adding this extra, like a lot of effort actually to like in, uh, integrating this into your game? Right. So the reason was uh, it was um, like a multi-level marketing scheme. So it's a go-to-market uh, user acquisition strategy. So if I tell you you can play this game and make $100 a day, you will download this app and you will play it for $100 a day. Almost, like a huge number of people. Or $300 a month. I think that's what it was at its maximum. Um, and so people actually weren't buying the axes, it turns out, because they couldn't afford them. They were too expensive. So these organizations called guilds went out, bought the axes, and then lent them to players to play for money um, and took a cut of that money and gave the rest to the players. And the players just made money playing. Money that was brought in from new players coming in wanting to play. But at a certain point, they weren't new players, they were just new businesses, like, like taxi cab medallions. Like I'm a company that owns medallions, I lend the medallions out to my drivers who go and drive for money, and then I take a cut. Now, uh, those guilds ended up holding a lot of axes that dropped a lot in value, especially the later ones. They sort of got you know, uh, cleaned out. Um, but what happened is those guilds we're like, oh my God, this is profitable. Like I buy an Axie, I get a player to play this game, and now I make money and that player makes money. And all of a sudden you have um, a company that didn't have a marketing team, didn't need a marketing team to acquire new players, right? Cottage Industries emerged to acquire new players for them. So they went from having like 200,000 players to like 5 million players in the span of a month um, on this kind of model. So why? User acquisition, that's the why. Um, because the pyramid entices people to come join thinking they're going to make money. And the same reason, why do people join normal pyramid schemes? They think they're going to make money. And in this case they did because the people who lost the money weren't the players for the most part, they were these guilds that did it. I hope that makes sense. Over here, and we'll go over here. Um, a few of the things I've been hearing over this week as the benefits of, of building on a blockchain are the interoperability and the ownership components. Um, I was just wondering how you factor interoperability into your mental model, thinking about these as funneling users to DeFi. Sure, that's a great question. So just to clarify, interoperability is this powerful concept, right? Because this uh, ledger is open, right? Um, anybody can read uh, what you're holding as assets, right? Um, and you know, um, the Steam marketplace is interoperable. For a while, you could even like gamble with your like CSGO skins on like gambling websites because the API was so interoperable and, and powerful. And so the interoperability isn't novel to crypto. We can have it anywhere we want. Um, it's default in crypto, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is um, interoperability is also a promise that keeps getting unfulfilled so if I'm a game developer that makes money selling NFTs, um, and now I've made that money, it's strange to think there'll be another game developer who will use the NFTs I made the money on, right? Like they make them passes to their game. The answer could be they want to siphon off my players, right? Say, hey, if you hold this NFT, here's a cool perk in, my, in, in this other game. And so it can be a way to user acquire. Say, people who own this asset, come, come to me, I'll give you a reward. 
Um, that might be why. Um, the other cool thing, though, beyond interoperability, um, and this is a big part of DeFi, um, is composability. So I like to think of interoperability as um, you can read data, um, but composability is you can activate logic. So like when you use Aave to borrow Maker, um, what you're doing is actually asking one program to activate the code in another program. And when programs start not just interoperating by reading their data, but using their logic across themselves, you might get an explosion of value. Um, that's, and, and that is what's happening in Dark Forest, right? The composability here as, we, like for instance in round four, we made a smart contract player in our guild. The player was just a piece of code. It couldn't really play the game, but what it could do is if you gave it a planet, it would cash out its points and give the planet back. And we had like 54 strangers, I think, like give this planet, uh, this, this smart contract their planets. It cashed out their points, then kept track of how many points they each gave it. Um, and then when it came 33rd on its own, uh, with the help of these other players, it could then like give that NFT to them pro rata for the points they gave, right? So that's really powerful, composability. Interoperability is less interesting and, and also more possible, whereas composability is really hard in Web2. Like, it's hard to use the logic of Dota in another game. Like, I don't know how you would get past the walled garden, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, over here. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Um, so it sounds like you've described this life cycle of those uh, games, like actually, uh, where, uh, you know, everything is great at the beginning, more and people start joining, joining, and eventually it collapses, right? Do you think that's just like forever what's gonna be, or do you think there's a way out of this cycle? Great question. There's a way to make your pyramid um, longer so that it explodes later. You can tweak the economics that way. It means giving up less money earlier. Um, there are ways to, um, look, he, here's what it is. Axie was paying players to play alone in their basements. That makes no sense because you're not creating value when you play alone in your basement or outside. You create value when you bring new players in. You create new value when you Twitch stream. You create new value when you run an esports tournament and people pay to watch it, right? You create value when you build a mod and people like to play with it. And if you create value, Web3 can capture it and redistribute it. That's a powerful feature of Web3. Um, in the case of Axie, by giving out value for things that weren't creating, it's an unsustainable model. It's like Uber paying you every time you take a cab ride. <laughs> Doesn't make sense, but Uber did pay you when you brought a new user onto the platform. That does make sense. So as long as you can make sure that the value coming in is greater than the value going out, then you can maybe guess that it's a sustainable model. I think that's a, a fair way to think about it. Thanks. But sorry, just real quick, oh, but eventually you're gonna run out of users, right? Like What? Eventually you're gonna run out of new users, Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? you eventually run out of new users, so what you need is those users to start I'm paying money, right? Like, I pay $15 to Dota to watch the international, right? Dota isn't paying me, it's paying the pros, right? So they keep getting paid money as long as new players are bringing in money. You have to capture value eventually. What's interesting about Axie is it can start capturing value in the financial instrument side and funnel that to the game side. The game could be the loss leader that you keep funding through other ways of capturing value because it's part of a rich ecosystem uh, that like is boggles the mind of a normal game maker, right? Because you're never a gamer and a game maker and a bank. And then all of a sudden that's what we're expecting you to be. Awesome, thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure. Hello. Um, Hi. In terms of the con, the overall con that you're describing that, you know, these are, games are UA to be on these blockchains and then you essentially people that don't have banks have banks. So the overall con about you building Web3 games that I understood from your talk. Isn't that how technology in general is in terms of a business? For example, Facebook, they provide this value to users, but well, they want your data. That's how they make their money. They're not expecting you to pay and, and get you to make money. Amazon, you can buy things really easily from them and it's convenient. And so you use them primarily for how you consume and make your shops. But they're not making money from the products you're purchasing. They're gathering your data and then using that data to feed 
all of the side businesses that they create. It just seems that it's expected that blockchains will have this secondary value, which is the primary value for them, by having games being well using their blockchain. Right. So, and and so that's 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 exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Like I think I think you you've got it. So if you're just making the game part, that's like just making the social media platform without any of the ads part, right? Like. Um, you'll ne you, that's unsustainable. You need to have a second source of revenue. Otherwise, there's no reason to make it on chain anyway in the first mm -hmm. place. Like you should just make a Web2 game and create value just through fun. What, what, what's happening here is Axie's creating value by doing user acquisition, right? So it's not about data here. It's about it could eventually be about data, but it's really about this huge friction barrier of getting people into Web3. Because once you get a Web3 user, they're worth so much money. Um, so yeah, I think it's expected when you think critically, but people aren't thinking critically about this. People really thought, like you could read these articles, they really thought Axie had solved universal basic income. Like the entire global south was just gonna play video games and make a living for the rest of their lives. I seriously, like nonstop could hear this, and I was just like, this, why do you believe this? The f laws of physics can't allow for this, and yet like that's, so that's, that's what I'm iterating here, I guess. Yeah, I think Axie is one of the examples in the space. And, you know, I think there is a difference when you have game designers who are experienced in building game economies that they could find a way to make it where the financial play of it is just another aspect of fun and not... I don't think everyone believed that play to earn is just a thing and you can live off making games. I think there's a percentage that believe that, I don't know. Do you think that everyone just expected to? Dur during the hype phase, it was pretty intense. And then it went from play to earn to play and earn. Right. And like people are on, you know, changing the message as they learn it and figure out what works. But yeah, like there are games where the economy is the fun, for yeah. sure. Like EVE Online is Yeah, like exactly, yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a great book, by the way, uh, called Virtual Economies by Vili Ledon Virta. Uh, it's so good. Yeah. And he talks about this, right? And that often game, game makers are going to give a little bit of currency to their players just so they can see the economic engine that's there and how enticing it is. So certainly there are blockchain games doing that. And as long as the loop is closed and there's no value bleeding out, like that can keep happening. But what's happening is these blockchain games, because they're on chain and they're interoperable and composable with all of DeFi, the tokens in that game are sellable. And if people are selling tokens, um, that means someone else is buying. And if they're buying because they want to make more money in the way that like I buy milkshakes from the milkshake person above me in the pyramid so I can sell more milkshakes to the people below me, like that will collapse. And so, yes, there's definitely a way to make a more sustainable economy. Um, and hopefully we'll see them soon. Um, but when you do, those sustainable economies are less viral, mm -hmm. right? So they, yeah. so they yeah. don't satisfy that purpose of loss leader for user acquisition. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Hi. I want to ask if blockchain games could be uh, a good solution to have people play PvP for, for money, basically. So let's suppose Clash Royale, you go in and you bet $1 before the match, and the winner takes you know, $1.9. Yeah, that is a good use case. Um, okay. Because the game isn't on chain. Um, the, the thing is, that's... Um, Gambling, uh, so you, there's a lot of laws you got to worry about. Um, even if it's like an entirely skill-based game, there are probably laws you have to worry about. Also, um, there's KYC problems, so you're not used to it. But like, you don't want to fund terrorism through this channel of moving money, so you become like a virtual asset service provider or a money service business. So like, it is doable. Um, it's just you have to figure out what you're gaining over just a dollar. Right, like, why not just put a dollar in the account and move the dollar over? And if what you think you're gaining is regulatory arbitrage, the answer is probably no. You're probably not gaining much because you're exposing yourself. Um, so, to, to 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 regulatory scrutiny. Right, because I was thinking of building that uh, in our PvP game, adding the ability to play, entering the room with tokens. Then the winner takes like 90% of the tokens. The other 10% goes to fund esports tournaments and also the dev team and the, and the expenses, but you say it's gonna be a regulatory problem. 
Yeah, I would say you're gonna have a lot of regulatory problems. Uh, so, what about skills? What? Skills is basically doing the cash-based tournaments. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I'm not your lawyer. I, I, can't, I can't, can't tell you, but I, I'd be worried. I would just okay. like, it raises, red, I think it's cool, bit, cool to explore it. I think it might be more efficient, um, especially if you want that gambling to use in-game tokens that are usable in your own economy and make a more smooth thing, but particularly more efficient if that's gonna be your way of onboarding users to financializing them. Right. If on top of letting them gamble, you also let them swap assets and then take <laughs> fees on that, make more money that way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's all we got for today, everybody. Thank you so much for, the, for attending. I really appreciate it. Thank you.